welcome everybody. Um, just want to introduce myself. I'm the curator Lizzie Collins, and it's I'm delighted to see so many of you here um, for our first event of our Art at Oxford Said series. It's the first event of the new academic year, and welcome to everybody who's also in the overflow. I think it's the first time we've had to operate that. Um, as many, many of you may know, this is the third year of the series which aims to explore the intersection between business and art. We take as our starting point for the exhibitions here at Oxford Said themes and ideas that are central to the values and teaching of the school. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Nicola Green for the launch of her exhibition, A Witness to Power. Nicola is a social historian and artist whose interest is in difference and in particular our perception of race and culture. In 2017, she co-curated the Diaspora Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, a pavilion that challenged the under-representation of artists and curators from minority backgrounds in the visual arts. In Nicola's exhibition here at the Said, we bring together two bodies of her work, the Encounter series and In Seven Days. This exhibition is about different role models and different examples of leadership. The work raises questions about the role the individual plays among the collective or the corporation and how communities, faith, political or business exchange ideas and enable social progression, all of which is important here at Oxford Said. These art and business talks are open to the community and we aim to promote discussion as part of these events and we do hope that you will have questions for our speakers and we will open up the floor during the discussion. You may already have seen some of the work as you enter the school. The life-size figures of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Dalai Lama are somewhat difficult to miss. <laughs> Um, these works are from the Light series, which is part of the overarching work called Encounters. After the talk, we will have the opportunity to see more work from the exhibition. In the link corridor, we have the series In Seven Days, a set of work that was born out of Nicola Green's experience of shadowing Barack Obama during his election campaign. And in the cloister corridor, we have more work from the Encounter series, a grid of 30 portraits of world faith leaders. It is here in the Cloister Corridor that we'll be holding drinks after the talk to which I warmly invite you all. This exhibition would not have been possible without the help of Alex Hammersley um, and Sarah Percy Davies from the Hollingwood Group. Thank you. And we're also very grateful to Lucy Cartledge and Audra Noble from Nicola's office. And I'm also particularly grateful to Rebecca Mumby, Alistair Scott and Joe Fawkes for their continued support with the Art at Oxford Saeed series. Without further ado, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome um, tonight to our moderator and co-speaker, Saib Agner. We are very grateful to Saib for making himself available this evening in his busy schedule. Saib is founder and CEO of the financial services company Lonwald and former governor of the London Business School. He is a great supporter of the arts and is passionate about bridging the gap between the world of business and of art. He's an author and has written two books, Art of the Middle East, Modern Contemporary Art of the Arab World and Iran in 2010, and Sand to Silicon, Going Global, Rapid Growth Lessons from Dubai. He is a patron of Art Dubai and chairman of the Dubai Financial Services Authority. And we're delighted to, both, to welcome both you and Nicola here today. It's great to be at Said Business School and thank you all very much indeed to have the Dean with us today and for everyone for arranging this. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I, I'm going to do the easy bit uh, and I'm going to put uh, Nicholas in the hot chair. Uh, and we're going to start off, Nicola, when we first met. We, we met a number of years ago. You had just finished the Obama project, which for those who haven't seen it, I just saw it and it's beautifully curated and displayed at the school. And you were starting to think about this project. Uh, and we sat down and we spent a couple of hours talking about uh, cultural issues. Uh, I had just uh, published the second edition of Art of the Middle East and we were going through th that part of the world as well and talking about conflict and talking about geopolitics and, uh, and I, I, I believe it was then called Only Through Others, uh, which has now become the Encounters Project. Um, and do, do, do you want to just run us through at that early stage of the project, where your thinking was, and, had, and, and, and how you evolved into it becoming what it is today, really, uh, and on all of these extraordinary people that you've spent time uh, uh, researching and then meeting and working on. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here and the work looks really amazing here. So I'm, uh, you know, it really does. Um, uh, and, and I'm excited to, for it to be here and to sort of have the audience that it does from all over the world here at the Saeed Business School. Um, so, yes, I met Saeed um, first a few years ago. He, we were introduced, actually, because I think mm -hmm. uh, the person that introduced us thought that Saeed was one of the few other people on the planet that had the kind of niche uh, <laughs> interest in, in, in art and the visual image and the power of the visual image and also interfaith and the kind of geopolitics of, of different faiths and and how the kind of intersection with art of different face and the history of art. So um, we, we had an amazing conversation. Um, Saib, actually, I, at the end of that long conversation, he, you know, I had actually sort of, I had been working on it for a few years and had been to a lot of the meetings. And he was like, you know, what you have documented, because what I have documented is 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 a, is a sort of is a new thing in history, uh, religious me leaders meeting with each other and talking publicly about each other's religion, mm. actually articulating that uh, in words is it's a completely new thing in history. Even meeting with each other, it it really is, and I can sort of talk about um, that history, but. Um, but we we sort of we we talked about the geopolitics, the the sort of meaning of it, and and the academic and intellectual aspect, I suppose. And sorry, but the end was like you know, but you've got a real big problem now in your hands. And I was like, oh what? And he was like, I can't see how you're going. How are you going to kind of resolve this as an artist and visually? And 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 it was you know that was that was really was the biggest challenge of the of 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 the project actually and um you know it has taken me uh many years so it's it's sort of it's really amazing to have Saib here now after after <laughs> agreeing to come here uh having sort of thrown down that challenge um i think i might sort of answer that question by saying um that when i started this project i really didn't completely understand what it was i i was really in i'm interested in difference i'm interested in it sort of you know understanding each other's interests kind of in a micro and a macro level and i was sitting having breakfast one morning uh, you know about 10 years ago and there was a tiny little piece in the newspaper and it said that the dalai lama was coming to visit the then archbishop of canterbury rowan williams and it was only the second or third time in history this had happened and i was really kind of astonished and interested in this and did more research into into the history of kind of religions and religious leaders meeting with each other and um, rang up Lambeth Palace and said, please, can I come and be a witness to that meeting? And they were like, uh, no. <laughs> um, obviously not. And, it not. and also, it's a private meeting. It's only the two of them. Uh, no. And I, I sort of, I carried on and on and eventually found out that the chief of staff there was the first Catholic Who'd ever, the first non-Anglican, actually, that had ever been employed at Lambeth Palace. So I went to see him, and I sort of thought he probably understands and is interested in interfaith. And as, you know, it, luckily for me, he was also interested in art and the visual image. And he said, you know, actually, Rowan Williams is really interested in both those things. Nobody's really focusing on these meetings. Nobody's talking it. They were really ad hoc and happening kind of just, there's no central kind of UN equivalent for religious leaders. And so it was, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't something you could publicly, you could find out about or anyway. So Rowan said that I could, come and the Dalai Lama agreed and it was literally just the two of them and me sitting in this two-hour meeting and um, there's been a picture of them sitting on a sofa. I arrived and it was kind of alarming because they had put a chair and they had them sat on a sofa and they put a chair there for me and they were like they, we thought this would be better for you doing your drawings and so on um, but actually you know I I sort of put on an invisible cloak and they ignored me and but because they were sat on a sofa there was nothing usually there's a table or mm. something in between them and they ended up holding hands for the whole two hours <laughs> and 
they both of them said they'd never either of them done that in a meeting before and they had they had some really tricky they were discussing some tricky things i mean it was not all mm. soft happy stuff and um anyway so that set me off and uh, and you know um they uh, rowan williams then kind of invited me to the next event that he did he went to india to the first ever meeting actually of um seven uh, Swamis from all over India and at the beginning of that meeting they said they had never met with each other mm. um, because actually they don't tend to travel people come to them and so it was a really big that was a big deal meeting and I and, and one thing led to another and I guess you know um, I'm saying this kind of like it sounds really easy it actually was not easy <laughs> it was really hard to persuade each of them to kind of let me sit in on it but I think that because I was recording everything visually in the end they they kind of they agreed because they were less threatened by the visual record than by the written record interesting because a lot of people will want to know how did you gain access how were you able to get access to all of these terribly important yeah uh, many of them very private people and you think one led to the other so well i um so rowan then took me to mm -hmm. lots of these meetings and he then asked everyone's permission and i think because he was so well respected mm -hmm. and because he ex he came to my actually before he did that he came to my studio mm -hmm. and he looked we had us we had a long conversation about in seven days and my intention with that work and how i'd approached it and what i was doing with that work and how i was putting into the it into the world and why i'd made it and i think that had a massive bearing on you know his trusting me and he then sort of extended that to the meetings that he was party to. So that, um, but there was a long discussion about me signing legal sort of documents and confidentiality. Um, but actually, at that point, it's sort of, it's, it's actually not really possible to create that kind of legal document. And so in the end, it came down to trust. And I, I really, I had to prove myself and I'm sort of neurotic about not ever betraying that trust and it's one of the reasons this project's taken me 10 years mm. is because I've thought incredibly carefully about every little bit of every aspect of this project there's a lot of very sen there's a lot of sensitivity mm -hmm. and um you know uh whilst at the same time and and, and actually I was telling their story mm. you know so that was a huge responsibility um, but in the end, there was nobody else telling this story. So I think after time, after I had sort of built that trust, they they actually became um, kind of invested, you know, they wanted me to tell the story because they believe in this and they weren't, you know, strangely, it, it's not like this, it was all a big secret, but but nobody was interested in what they were doing. Mm. And so they were finding it hard actually to tell the story of what they were doing. And I think they almost needed somebody sort of independent that was not within their religion or their, their office mm. or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so um, I mean, I've got lots of stories of persuading some of the different religious leaders and how that, the, the kind mm. of ups and downs of that. And, you know, the chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, it took me three and a half years to persuade him. <laughs> uh, but once, once I'd persuaded him, then he, he, he then really got it. And now, you know, he's written, mm -hmm. he's written in this book and he, um, he was interesting as well because he, one of the reasons he didn't, want me to sort of spend time with him was he said that you know Judaism is not a it's not a religion of the visual image it's a it's a religion of the book and the word they don't ha really um kind of invest in architecture never mind kind of mm -hmm. you know sculptural visual artifacts and he said he personally wasn't interested in it either n not n you know his religion nor he personally and actually he kind of went on a journey eventually in the work that I did in, in and he talks about this about kind of understanding the power of the visual image actually and why it is important so that was really an amazing journey actually slightly a sub um, mm. 
is. Which, which is really interesting that it could lead us to many people might look at the works and wonder why the faces are painted out. Mm. And this facelessness, yet recognizable, obviously, from religion or background. But tell us more about that. I mean, why are the faces painted out and, and, and what led to that? Well, so I, um, you know, I was really interested in kind of trying to reflect this kind of new history that I had witnessed and documented, which was um, that basically that they were sort of sharing a platform for the mm -hmm. first time in history. And that, and that actually the reason that they hadn't throughout history is really sort of to do with hierarchy and power. And, and so I, I kind of wanted to reflect. I, I then also found that, you know, this I'm been told now by all the academics and art historians around the world that this is the first artwork this to portray all the religions and all the religious mm. leaders in one artwork together and so there's a kind of and actually just as an image everybody's you know there's a uh, everybody's separate um, but and completely defined by their own religion. There's no kind of cross fertilization of the religious imagery in the backgrounds at all. They're completely distinct, and yet they um, are all kind of together and and equal. And there is no hierarchy. And as part of that, I also I kind of I I realised that I didn't want this sort of common visual language, if you like, this common and yet distinct visual language to be sort of interrupted by the, um, I don't know, the facial features of each of, of each of those individuals, which is quite distracting. And actually, as a viewer, we bring most of our prejudices to bear when we first, when we see somebody. Mm. And so I wanted to kind of try as best I could to remove those prejudices, but also, I mean, there's actually a very long answer to the painting out of the faces. There's a history of an iconism in, in lots of religions, which is incredibly interesting. And there's a wonderful chapter, there's a couple of chapters in this book about from an Islamic academic, a his, art historian and, and, and a Christian, one who works at the National Gallery. And but But also I wanted to kind of reflect on the um, nature of these leaders who in their role are representing mm -hmm. a religion and they're representing the present and the history of that religion and all the people that follow that and there's a kind of internal dialogue for them about them as an individual and what they represent and actually all of us most of us have that mm -hmm. um, in different ways in our job and uh, in our life and um, so but yes I I also then chose a kind of, as far as it's possible, a kind of neutral raw, a variation of raw umber colours, basically, to mm. try and kind of remove the politics of race and skin colour. So, yeah, so... I mean, what comes across as very interesting is they're all separate, yet together they're one. Yes. There is this oneness to it all. There is an undertone of, of, of this religious, cultural understanding or, or empathy or spirituality, whatever that may mean. Uh, yet everyone is separate. You've met everyone separately, but when you mm. look at the cover of your book or you look at it hung, you see them as one as well. Uh, yeah, well, that's... they. First of all, they, they never all have all met all together. Right. <laughs> but obviously I was documenting them meeting in different mm. variations. So I wanted to reflect that. But, but um, uh, you know, so the backgrounds are all different patterns. And this became the most kind of, in a way, the most exciting part of the production of this work for, for, for me and for everybody in my studio, which is that... Um, in terms of kind of common language between religions, between cultures, between human beings, mm -hmm. one of the things that we all throughout history have always sought to do is create patterns. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and I think that it's a kind of human need to create patterns, to, to make sense of the world. Nature creates the most incredible mm -hmm. patterns. And I suppose we reflect nature by, by creating our own patterns. And the history of patterns and textiles are, is kind of incredible because actually if you take any one element, you know, from all of these backgrounds and go right 
back to its source, um, there's a kind of there's a there's a common source basically, and I think that's to do with our common humanity basically. And you know, since the Silk Route, since we were able to travel and exchange ideas, we have been exchanging imagery and symbols, and so nothing actually exists in perfect isolation, and no religion exists in perfect isolation. So so whilst all the patterns are completely true to each religion and I was very careful to make sure that they were not you know I wanted to reflect what the religious leaders themselves were doing which is was not in any way to say we're the same um, was to kind of completely retain their own uh, strength and power of their own belief which in many ways I suppose in you know religious belief is the most sort of um, uh, it's the most complete, if you like, that, that sort of excludes uh, intellectually and, uh, you know, other beliefs. And, and so it, it theologically has been very difficult for them to work out how to talk about each other and not undermine their own belief. So and I wanted to reflect that visually, I suppose. So that's kind of what I've tried to do in the back in the backgrounds and with these with these patterns is to keep the strength of each each separate belief but kind of look at the connections I mean interesting to of course an art historian as well as an artist and you spend a lot of time studying theological issues and political issues and 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 something we both believe in and something you've written about is the importance of culture as a, as this cultural especially in today's polarized world that it makes this wonderful bridge for crossing cultural divides. Mm. And there are many forces, of course, who want to not allow this bridge to be built or destroy it if it's built. And works like yours just keep reinforcing this. And I suppose partly all of these leaders got that message, which is why they supported your works. And, and so the importance of it. And you said earlier, there's no United Nations for religions, which is true. Mm. There isn't one. Uh, but you're expressing it through through your art. And, and, and do you see this perhaps as a way to preserve and build on this religious and cultural understanding, uh, especially in today's world where we need it probably more than ever uh, uh, with the rhetoric and with, with the polarized views that we see yeah, around yes. the world? Well, I think that, you know, the one of the reasons that these religious leaders have, um, you know, sort of made these changes over the last decade, it, it really, it came out of uh, after 9-11, that there mm. was a very sort of, mm. co they started to consciously get together and realise that they, they had to kind of make an intervention and start um, kind of talking about each other and, and kind of treading in a domain that I suppose maybe politicians weren't, but also that they realised they only they could. And I think that, you know, certainly in the West, but probably globally too, you know, there's been a kind of separation of religion and um, uh, and and power and politics. And so, you know, certainly in the West, there's been very little, not much attention paid to religious leaders. So they've also kind of occupied this space where they, I guess, have been able to tread in places that politicians and prime ministers and presidents have not been able to mm. tread. Mm. And so I think that, you know, partly because... In, in some ways, because their political power has been a bit has been diminished over the years, perhaps that's partly why they have also been able to kind of, um, you know, to maybe able to tread here. I I mean, I don't know how they mm. themselves would answer that question, but um, uh, it's <clears throat> there's no question that they have they have I have witnessed meetings where they have been sort of occupying a soft power kind of position mm. of 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 um i don't know i guess as emissaries of countries where they have been mm. kind of negotiating really tough difficult things i've been in really re i've witnessed really really tough difficult meetings particularly in the middle east and in in jerusalem and and i think that you know 
these meetings don't sort of solve everything, but actually they they have had they have had an ability to kind of move into um, areas that politicians have maybe struggled, mm -hmm. um, and the kind of polarization and 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 kind of entrenching of views in politics, I guess, has meant you know maybe that the the, the kind of uh, it, it's meant that there's a real serious mm. need for mm. uh, leadership to to kind of be addressing that in, in a in in a sort of cultural uh, in a cultural mm. sense mm. Um, and and to your point of sort of preserving religious heritage I actually went to an amazing conference and gave the keynote recently at Groningen University where they were focusing just on shared religious heritage which is a complete also a completely new topic mm. So actually, how we preserve sh shared religious heritage is a, is a sort of big is a question. And I, I mean, interesting. We talk about the faces, and we talked about just the one thing. Maybe many of the women in the audience, if I may move into gender, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 a very delicate subject. And I'll choose my words very carefully, and I, and I <laughs> apologize in advance if I, if I make any any inadvertent mistakes. But someone will look at your images and say there are thirty one. And there is one woman, uh, and, and I'm sure they can't help but say why. Uh, so, so that's the first one. And the second one, <clears throat> I know your next project is going to is talking is dealing with gender issues, and, and actually particularly with women issues. And I, and I understand there's a faculty member here who's working, who's worked on that and done research about the inequality of pay in artists. If I, sorry, if I can say that, uh, uh, if I may, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and the pay of, of women artists versus men artists. But where are the women? <laughs> well, where are the women is, is basically the subtitle <sighs> to Encounters. And when I very first installed this work, I had, we had actually some pe women getting really angry um, and uh, you know I thought about this so much when I started the project I knew that it was mostly men but I must say that it, it was only after having kind of forensically been all over the world I, that I realized that you know almost without exception Dharmic religions Abrahamic religions indigenous kind of spiritual beliefs you know North, south, east, west of the globe, um, at lead at the senior, the most at the top kind of leadership level, and at, you know not all religions mm -hmm. are hierarchical, but nevertheless at the top most senior sort of leadership level, there are no women, and I it's actually shocking, and it wasn't really until I kind of you know was halfway through this project that that we realised, and I mm -hmm. that anyone realised, I suppose no one has forensically kind of made this work that you know, to see quite how shocking it is and also how kind of comprehensive uh, across across the world. And I might say that also what I had not thought about before I did this project is that I would always be almost again, almost without exception over the 10 years, the only woman in the room. And I might add the only one usually wearing trousers. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, so, and there's, a, there's um, a wonderful chapter in this book by uh, Marianne Saunders talking about kind of the role of women in, the, in most sacred texts. The women have the role of witness, but not as not a voice, which I sort of felt in some ways was the position I had in this story. Um, but, you know, I think uh, that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother discussion that is, mm -hmm. you know, is really interesting and is really does, is, um, you know, Susan Sontag's talked a lot about the artist slash photographer and about the kind of male versus female role, you know, of, of, of kind of that you take on. And I think that I was, I was kind of very carefully having to kind of straddle both. And, uh, and, and. In, 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 in kind of closing, we've got five minutes left. I, I think probably one of the things that a lot of people might want to know or would like to know is, is are there three, two or three examples of really insightful things that you've, you've seen that are, you know, either in the Obama campaign period, that you've spent a lot of time with the former president, or with the religious leaders which have made you stop? I mean, I'm sure everyone has, but are there some really strong things? And is there a commonality in leadership 
spiritual and political? Okay, so I think um, that's a massive question, mm-hmm. and we don't have very long. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna ask, so, I was gonna answer it with with one insight, and I've, you know, obviously got many more. I was very lucky to spend time with Obama in, you know, in 2008 before he became president, during the time that, you know, honestly, nobody thought he was going to be president. On the night that he became president, um, you know, he gave a speech, which probably lots of people watched in Grant Park in Chicago. And, you know, they had the whole of Grant Park, there were a million and a half people or whatever in, in Grant Park. And they did it in the middle of the night so that, so that, so that the whole world, so it would sort of catch the news of the whole world. So it was pitch dark. And yeah, it was, I can't remember, like 11 o'clock at night or something. And, um, uh, and you know, he came onto that long uh, kind of runway, uh, if you remember, and he did this amazing speech. And, you know, um, uh, all his team and all his supporters and lots of people around the world who, you know, normally other countries don't really care that much about the kind of party politics, really, of other countries. They really don't. This was the most watched event, I think, you know, I understand in human history because, because, because this wasn't really about party politics. This was about something new, somebody that looked like Obama becoming, you know, the most powerful person in the world. Anyway, after he'd finished that speech, he went sort of behind, they had a little tent. And you, I was expect, and I went into this little tent and I I was expecting, you know, like everywhere else, to be a kind of big party and a celebration. He'd been campaigning nonstop for nearly two years. And, you know, I was expecting a kind of relief and at least, I don't know, a glass of wine or champagne or something. And no, I was sort of, he came into that little uh, room. There were, there were actually four tents. One had some politicians, one had some funders, one, I don't know, maybe had local politicians. And then, and then the other one was for his friends and family. That was the one he went into first. And there was a quite a, a kind of, he came in and it was like, oh my God, the energy was so heavy. It was the opposite of the news, the, the Grand Park, the everywhere else that I'd witnessed. Um, and it was sort of heavy and he came in and he said you know that's done it now and you could just physically see this the kind of burden on him and I was you know in in a we don't have time for me to sort of talk about the seven images in in seven days but the it, on a lit each one has all <laughs> a lot to unpack in each of those images but day six sacrifice embrace which is a blue background and just has his head and his hands that image kind of comes from that experience that I had watching him then because I was just totally blown away by that kind of sense of for him that was that that sort of the tension of the huge sacrifice he was making and the burden that he was taking on and that everybody else was able to celebrate but for him you know he was just beginning this huge kind of responsibility and um yeah I think uh uh that 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 image as well I think it kind of it's one of the most powerful I feel like I've made and it actually relates in many ways back to this work and 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 to that kind of you know uh he does have a faith and I think he you know he would he's needed it probably but yeah I, I'll end there because I think we might have run out of time. No, and, 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 and in closing, on, on, well, we have, we have a Q and A session, of course, coming. Uh, but in closing, I think Nicola, what, what, what really is quite profound in that, and when I asked, the, the, is there a commonality between political and spiritual leadership? I think when you see the the, the, the Obama works, and then um, you see the religious leaders and works, I think, uh, uh, unlike. Uh, the spiritual elements of religious leaders. Uh, politicians not all have that spiritual element, but they, you're saying that there are those few that have this magical thing uh, 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 that comes across and almost transcends politics mm. at a moment in time. And I think you've, you captured it just wonderfully in, in the Obama works. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank Nicola Green for, for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, 
I, I, I've been given the task of, of, of moderating the Q&A session. We're going to start there, if I may. Right. Uh, yes. Thank you, Nikola. Thank you for your time. Uh, so a very small question. When did you realize that your work was done? Interesting. Very good question. And, and very short and succinct. <laughs> so well done. Thank you. So, 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 so when was it all finished? Yeah, that's also a really hard question for me. <laughs> um, okay, so there's two parts to that, because one was, you know, I spent 10 years with all these religious leaders and following them. I, I could have carried on. So I, I had to kind of put my own deadline, actually, or I would, uh, you know, and, and I feel like I'll probably spend the next 10 years kind of talking about this work because it, it's so it's so dense there's so much to unpack um so i had to i actually you know 10 years seem like a, I, I i had to put a deadline at that or i realized that i would never make any other work uh, but in terms of the actual that was witnessing and going you know on journeys with the religious leaders in terms of making the work um i i you know, it wasn't done until I knew that when Saib came round, he, it, you know, he, he'd say, yeah, you managed that, basically. And that, that took me four years, four and a half years. That was a lot of work. Just the backgrounds alone, just making those backgrounds and sort of doing the research, that was kind of two years work. Audra here did a lot of the research. That was a huge job in itself. Um, but, and I, I don't know, it's a strange thing as an artist. It's sort of, you know, in some ways, it's hard to let go of it. Um, I would say that in Seven Days and Encounters, but are the, probably the two, only two, you know, artworks I've made where I did get to a point where I felt like th this is done. And I, I think it might have been because I spent so long mm. on them. And I was quite monastic as well about how I approached it. I didn't really tell, I didn't, you know, with a, in seven days, I told nobody apart from my husband uh, that I was making that work. Nobody, because I felt, I knew that I would get completely distracted and distracted with, with the kind of the goal of the work, which was not to comment on the politics or the party politics or what was happening in the moment, but, but um, to uh, create a work that would be sort of a meaning, meaningful legacy and that was a completely different intention. Um, so I guess I had a clear intention, so I did manage to get to a point where I, it was finished. But, uh, uh, you know, I still do look and think. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, there. What sort of chemistry did you see between different sects of the same religion? Uh, mm. Yes. Well, that's a really good question. And, and, and actually, um, <clears throat> I remember very early on uh, doing quite a lot of work with the kind of Anglo in the Anglo-Catholic community. And, and that is still kind of <coughs> held up as a sort of beacon of what is actually possible. And there's obviously a lot of discussion about that kind of being raised up again, you know, mm. politically at the moment. Um, but... Um, uh, uh, you know, often there's just as much difference, you know, within a religion as there is uh, outside. I think that I think that it's not the same as politics, though, because I think that I think what I did find sort of within religions and I mean, obviously, you know, there's internal politics, obviously, but but I think that um, it, religious leaders and religion in certainly in the West has been under sort of some attack actually with sort of sec the rise of secularism and I think that I did I I was there is a sort of story about how religious leaders within religions and out you know and with each other you know across religions have been um, very focused on on kind of what they can what they share basically in terms of kind of actually uh, having a faith and and how they can kind of understand that and they they talked about that a lot together in in meetings that mm. i was in and i think i i 
I haven't sort of fully explored that, I think, in some ways, but I think that uh, perhaps that is also a new thing, as well as the interfaith dialogue, that kind of realisation that it's important to kind of, um, you know, really uh, hold on to what, what we have in common, I suppose, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Microphones, please. Can we bring one here and then there? Nicola, on what order do you hang these um, portraits? Is it always in the same order? And if it is, why? Yeah, that's a really... So the question is, in what order are this series hung? And is there a hierarchy or is there a reason or colour or...? I know. Uh, I, uh, you know, Audra sitting here will uh, say, well, you know, we, I think, I don't know how long we spent, maybe an actual whole week. It was like having a puzzle on the floor <laughs> because I made them, I made them with all of this, you know, everything that I've said, I didn't make it from the beginning as one artwork. Each of these portraits exists in its own right, mm. as you can mm. see. And I did not, mm. I think it would have been a, a total nightmare. I don't know if I'd have ever actually been able to finish if I I'd tried to make it from the beginning all work together mm. and um, I don't know what I'd have done if it didn't actually but but we sat when we had all 30 and we were first going to install them on I, I can't tell you it was like doing a it was really like doing a puzzle and and it didn't work and it didn't work and they I you know they were turned away from each other or visually it didn't work or you know you know the different um, you know, different kinds of Muslim or Christian or whatever suddenly ended up all together, you know, or, you know, it was, and I, and I really wanted it to um, not have any hierarchy um, or having their backs to each other or, and, and, and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work. And then finally, uh, it worked. <laughs> We're taking a photo of that because it took so long. I don't know that there is another solution to those particular 30 hanging together. So the answer is yes, they have to go in that order. <laughs> or there'll be some kind of derail. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you ever find yourself needing to relay in your images um, messages of love and re um um, acceptance and maybe hide more tense moments and if so do you think that ever maybe hides or sacrifice the authenticity of the actual encounters sorry do you, are you saying that are you asking if I've somehow if I've slightly diminished the difficulty I guess because most of the images you know mm. by nature I'm, yeah. I'm assuming you're trying to show that most of the images uh, most of the religions have things in common with each other or that yeah so. yes I mean I I'm not I am not trying to say that this that that you know I a not all not all religious leaders are talking to each other. B you know it's not all perfect harmony. No. Um, C as I mentioned, m there wasn't a single meeting that I witnessed where there wasn't quite a lot of very serious disharmony and difficulty. And really, they were tackling really difficult subjects. You know, I went to parts of the world where, you know, um, people are being killed in the name of, you know, conversion or whatever. You, they, you know, never mind kind of the awareness of you know, wars and, you know, so no, it was not, I, I'm not trying to hide that. And I would never say that, it, I'm not trying to sort of say that this work is somehow um, kind of, you know, projecting some resolution at all. I, 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 what I would say is that this is just a baby steps. And all that I think what interests me is that, is, is that, you know, Human, these human beings at leadership level have started behaving differently for the first time in history. And, I, and really, I felt like that was worth noticing and documenting because, because actually, um, I don't know what that means and I don't think they know what that means yet. But actually, throughout the whole of history, human history, that hasn't happened and now it has. Uh, it didn't start on one day 10 years ago, by the way. It, it sort of started in the civil rights movement and then the anti-apartheid movement and kind of has developed on from that. But but um, I haven't... I mean, 
Actually, there are photos that have come up on the wall and there are, you know, of meetings where really difficult things were happening. And not everybody is all kind of smiling and, you know, uh, I suppose I was focused on documenting the fact that they were had sort of attempting this new behaviour, basically. And that's partly I, you know, it's another reason why I painted out the faces, actually. It is so as not to be kind of making a statement, you know, they're not all laughing and it's all, you know, perfect. Um, mm, wonderful. Uh, um, right, we're going to go one, two, three and close uh, in, in five minutes. We're going to start here. Which was uh, your um, most surprising or memorable encounter? So maybe surprising. That yeah. would be into because it wasn't planned, maybe partly, or or or, or surprise, oh, even if it was. God. Not what you. Do expected. you know what? It, it, uh, you know, f within seven days and encounters, what I would say is that every time I went anywhere, I I I had no certainty, and uh, you know, I actually every single trip. Although I mean, we haven't got into this, but although Obama had agreed for me to do this, his staff didn't want me to. And there was, I would fly across the world. I'd leave my babies at home. I, I there was, I didn't know if I was even going to see him for, you know, in the distance for two seconds. Never mind, be right next to him until, and I did, and I spoke to him, and I was right next to him every time. But every time there was a different story and a different reason why that may not, might not have happened. And actually, the same with the religious leaders. I was normally told, uh, for reasons of confidentiality and trust and all the rest of it, that I could be there for a, a few minutes and then I'd have to leave. And almost always, I didn't, and I stayed for the whole meeting and. You know, over time, you know, I could, but um, something surprising always happened. I'm dying to tell you the story of the Pope Benedict kind of blessing the project. You know, um, it will, there's two more questions. I feel like uh, I, I, I might write those down and post them actually. Um, but uh, every time something surprising happened that I wasn't expecting. Great. Right, yes, uh, one, two. So burgundy top and pink top, <laughs> right, burgundy. Um, I'm really interested in the one woman. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> I was wondering Good. If you, in, um, in, a, in a few yes. seconds, yes. tell us Who a bit more it? about yes. her and it, your experience with her. It's Rabbi um, Laura Jenner Klausner, who's the uh, exact title, sorry, Laura. <laughs> There you go. Um, and, you know, uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether she was going to be in it because in our pie chart of the religions, 84% of the world has a faith and how many people, you know, belong to each faith and each subsection of each faith. You know, the head of the Reformed Church in the UK uh, of Judaism didn't doesn't even make a, a, a skinny line. Um, but I, I decided to put one woman in because, you know, we've this, she was the only woman that I found across the world that had the no, leadership, no. the leadership role, basically. Good. So that's why. Yeah. Quick, second question. Sorry. I should say no, actually, <laughs> but, but really no. We have to go there. I'm so sorry. Right. Well, mine is the final question. Where do you sorry. go from there? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, maybe. Uh, well, it's linked to that one. So it's the woman, the, right? Um, yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. But I think that you know, I've, I've, I'm going to the women, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and and I've started working on that, and I'm and I'm focusing on women in power. But um, uh, I've just started on that. So you know, watch this space. <laughs> And I, I, I have to say, 60% here almost are women, which I, I find fascinating, uh, having looking, uh, looking at the room. And, and, and that's why it's so, you know, so powerful as a message to see this and to see there is no women except the token one. I think, you know, good luck on the, on the women project. And uh, it's fantastic. In closing now... Oh, no, uh, one question from the other room, if, we, if I 
I mean, yes, one, well, exceptionally. They haven't, they haven't okay, go on, research. go on. Okay. Um, and the question is, how did you choose the colours on the standing portraits in the business school lobby, and how did you decide the size and scale? Oh, that's yeah. a great question. I love right. that, that, that somebody's asked that question. Um, uh, Just contextually, this is the silhouettes, the, the, the ones yes. that are outside at the entrance of the business school. Yes, right. which I are all painted sort of reverse glass painting you saw uh, there were a sort of time lapse of those paintings um on the question of the size i wanted to make them life size and i could give a whole lecture on how hard it is as an artist to make a perfect life size complete body because you never have you, you know when we look at each other uh you don't you have a sort of you have a perspective your eyes are always at one place you know you never look at somebody right in the middle and even if you did there's sort of foreshortening up and down so so when in taking a photo uh, you know when you do a painting you are actually able to kind of um, compensate for that like the eye does um, but it, nevertheless you still have to make some sort of decisions and then if you've got the feet in there they're not sort of straight at you so you can't but we did actually measure every <laughs> religious leader and work out <laughs> Audra had that job <laughs> of measuring everybody <laughs> and working out their relative size to each other and <laughs> so it was it was <laughs> and then everybody's feet were in different slightly different positions and they were standing in different stances so we had to so it's not it's not forensic or perfect but we did our best and they are all just very slightly um, larger than life size because because when you go up and meet them if they were exactly life size they would have kind of ended up um, looking not quite life size so that's also kind of you know uh, and there is almost this mystique to it because there is this hologram almost mm. kind of translucence so it, it is like yeah so it's, it's sort of mystical. it is a bit mystical and mm. the, and the colors are are really are true to their to their uh, to the outfits that they mm. wore. The accent colour that you chose. Oh, oh, the perspex colour on the back. Oh, okay. Well, I was a little bit limited. If I if the world had been my oyster with those live edge perspex, uh, but I'm afraid until somebody here invents, uh, you know, uh, or wants to work with me on producing all different colours of live live edge perspex, or you know, that I was limited in the the colours I could get, and I and I, and they were I really chose contrasting colours to to the paintings that I had made. I did try actually, you know, the Grand Mufti is green. I did try to kind of um, reflect a little bit the sacred colour. Um, kind of specific to each religion, but that wasn't entirely possible. The Pope is is red, and that you know, so and uh, the Chief Rabbi is blue. So they they, as far as possible, they have got the colour that um, is most meaningful to them and to their religion. Well, that's fantastic. This this it brings to a close something that really is truly fascinating. And I, and, I, and I think for all those who are studying here, I just want to say how wonderful it is to be in a business school where an element of this liberal art, art and culture is brought in. And to have the dean sit in on the whole thing with his top team and to see this. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really. Really. And, and uh, it's been a great honor, of course, uh, and privilege and pleasure, Nicola, to have known you during all of this journey and this wonderful time. And I think today, more than ever, uh, we need these type of cross-cultural, cross-religious, cross-political uh, 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 discussions and talks and, and understandings. Uh, and and uh, Nicola's husband, as you may all know, is, is a very, very well-known a uh, UK politician. Politicians at the moment are very busy during October, so he couldn't be with us, uh, but, but, but hopefully he'll have more time after the 31st of October. So we'll hope to see uh, him back here at the school with Nicola then. But I'd like to thank Nicola very much indeed for a wonderful evening with you thank today. You. Thank you.